Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm Denise George, Attorney General of the U.S. Virgin Islands. Justice Matters is a program aimed to inform, engage, and empower you with knowledge of Virgin Islands laws and legal issues that affect our everyday lives and our community, including exciteful and exciting discussions with special guests so you can be empowered to make a difference and be a part of the solution. Today's topic is all about the Virgin Islands Office of Gun Violence Prevention. It is a brand new, at least for the Virgin Islands program, but what is it and what can we, we expect from it? Well, first of all, the Office of Gun Violence is established by Virgin Islands law. Title III, Section 27I states, there is established within the Office of the Governor of the Virgin Islands, the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. The office is tasked with formulating effective and innovative strategies designed to reduce and prevent gun violence in the Virgin Islands and to make recommendations to the legislature of the Virgin Islands for legislation to strengthen gun laws and for initiatives that provide recreational, vocational, and economic opportunities for young adults in the Virgin Islands. The office was just established earlier this year, and at this time, it only has an executive director who is joining us now on Justice Matters to talk about what we can expect from the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Executive Director Antonio Emanuel. Well, welcome to Justice Matters, Mr. Emanuel. Well, thank you for having me, Attorney George. How long have you been the executive director of the Office of Gun Violence Prevention? Well, just Pre a few Prevention. months. I, um, I started in March, mm -hmm. and we're still trying to get the office on the rails. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work. But we're, we're up for the challenge. Yeah, it's still just a baby. It's still <laughs> just a baby. That's good. Are you the only employee so far? The only person there so far? So far, right? yes, I'm the only employee. Okay. Well, I want to know just a little bit about your background so the, the, the public can hear about a bit about your background, especially in the law enforcement area that actually prepares you for this type of position. Well, I, um, I started policing in Montgomery County, Maryland, right outside of D.C., I, I, I worked there as a police officer for 25 years. I rose to the ranks as and retired as a deputy commander mm -hmm. of a district, which is equivalent to a, a deputy chief here. It's a very it's a it's a major city chief organization, a large accredited organization. And while I was there, I did a lot of similar work. I did outreach work there. I worked with youth. I worked with um, at risk communities. Mm -hmm. um, we did, um, I, I worked with Explore program, and I did a lot of training. Most of, most of my career was involved in training, field training and, ac and academy training. So I have um, a very varied background in law enforcement as far as doing the outreach work. What do you want to bring to this position? When you, as, as director, the first director of the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Well, I, there's a couple things. I, I, I certainly want to, 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 to try to, save our community. I, I, it, it breaks my heart when I hear of, you know, the young people trying to have a nice party and then somebody brings a gun to it and shoots somebody or shoots an innocent person. Um, and then I also want to to look at how our strategies, how we're going to inter, inter, interface with our communities, give opportunities to folks, um, connect them with the right resources. Um, and also, my, when I do get my staff, I, I want my staff to really operate the office from the lens of procedural justice, where we work from, you know, allowing our citizens to have a voice and we hear what their concerns are, that we, we react with impartiality. Our office operates out of an, a place of transparency so that the public knows what we're doing, how we're responding and why we're responding, why we do the strategies that we do. The legislation, as, as um, I've mentioned before, legislation is actually what created the Office of um, Gun Violence Prevention. And uh, a part of that legislation requires a staff. And a staff consisting of, let me see, it says, among the staff of the Virgin Islands Office of Gun Violence Prevention shall be an executive director, mm -hmm. district directors, which I, I suppose would be on each island. Right. Right. They say a survivor survivor engagement specialists, mm -hmm. community engagement coordinators, and also um, violence interrupters. So I'm going to first start with the, um, the, the survivor engagement specialist. What is that? The survivor engagement specialist is a person that is going to respond to a scene, um, 
deal with the family and coordinate some wraparound services for them to help them deal with their grief, deal with the trauma, mm -hmm. vicarious trauma, being involved in something. And, and we understand that there, there, there are other organizations that are out there. We, BIPD has the Victims Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. There are other nonprofit organizations that are doing that same work. We are not trying to stop them from doing any of that. Right. Um, it's, it's about supplemental work and helping out as much as we can. We know there's people out there doing fantastic work and we want to support that and keep okay. them going. Okay. Um, but, but our job is to, if, if that isn't available, then we are going to step in and do try to try to embrace that family at, at the same time, also trying to get them to resources and counseling to, to try to, to reduce their feelings that they want to retaliate. Right, I see. Right, right. That and that is the survivor engagement specialist. Do you have that person on staff yet? Not yet, but we we have some people in 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 the works in the okay. pipeline getting ready to get hired for that job. Okay, great. What about the community engagement coordinators, which is also a requirement to right. have the, on your staff? The community engagement coordinator is the, is 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 more of a out of the three jobs, probably the most fun job. It is the person that's going to coordinate a lot of activities, events, mm -hmm. um, even working with other organizations that are doing events. For instance, um, National Night Out is coming up soon. Mm -hmm. So our office will be assisting with that. We did Oswald Harris Courts uh, Wellness Day, mm -hmm. and we participated in those events. We're also, that, uh, that person in that office will also be responsible for doing um, PSAs or public service announcements and anti-violence pr um, prevention information, um, strategies, or giving uh, people safety hints, uh, how, to be, how to stay safe. So that it's kind of an interesting position where they get to be out in the community and, and, and engage them in community events, activities that are geared towards nonviolence type of activities. So it is just pretty much what it says, what the job title says, community engagement coordinators. They right. do exactly that and, right. And, and the, one of the hardest parts, I think, for that, for that position is going to be able to come up with a resource list of nonprofits, faith, based groups that are doing activities in the community mm -hmm. and trying to keep a calendar mm -hmm. of all those things that are going on. I mean, there, there is so much going on in our community that we, that we just don't hear or know about. Mm -hmm. And because this, it, it, and, and, and not any fault to the organizations, they, they do their advertisements and, and have events, but it just, sometimes it just doesn't get around everybody because not everybody picks up a daily news every day. Not everybody gets on social media every day. Right. Um, and not everybody calls everybody to tell them, hey, did you hear about this, this event they're having? They're having a march mm -hmm. for victims on Saturday. Can you come out? So, right. you know, we, we, we want to have somebody that, that, that gets tuned in and dialed in mm -hmm. on those things and, and try to get, that, and get yeah. that information That's out there so thing. everybody can be um, right. involved and, and, and feel supported. Right, right. Okay, that's great. Um, what about that position, the, the, the community engagement coordinators? Um, still looking, right? So far, well, we have. I, I think I have somebody identified on mm -hmm. St. Thomas and St. Croix. Okay, so awesome. we're 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 we're, okay. we're getting there. We're rolling, right? We're getting there. <laughs> we're rolling. That's we're good. getting there. That's I'm good. trying to, you know, it's hard because they're, you know, we start interviewing people and and having people send in resumes and and tell me what they're doing. There's a lot of talent out there, and and mm -hmm. and people are passionate. I mean, yes. you know, and they they really want to come in. They want to help. And, and I, I wish I could take them all, mm -hmm. but I, I really have to try to find the smartest and brightest and most dedicated to the mission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I take this job very personal. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, when, when the job came open, I applied because I, I had lost a friend. You know, I, I mentored two young men when I, I worked for, I also, we talk about my background, I also worked for Cruise and Rum for a while oh, okay. and Avenza. And so VI. do you have connections to the VI then? Yeah, absolutely. My, my, actually, my family's from Gallows Bay in St. Croix. Oh, Roy. okay. okay. And, uh, All right. So I'm part of the Emanuel family. Eugene mm -hmm. Emanuel used to be a professor at UVI. He's, oh, yes. my, he's yes. my cousin. Oh, definitely. He's well known. Um, yeah. So okay, I, I, I came back home to, 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 to do service again, you know, mm -hmm. so I worked for VIPD for a while. Um, but while I worked at Cruise and Rum, I, I mentored two young men mm -hmm. into 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 the security department. I was I was their director of security. I cre actually created their security from the ground up. Right. And 
one young man became a police officer and another young man stayed there. And he did so well that they, they moved him up through the ranks. He became a foreman. Mm -hmm. And I was just so proud of both of them. And then Kai Javois, he gets killed. Wow. And then um, Dale Fernand, he gets killed in his front lawn. Um, and two one, different separate incidents. Two separate incidents. Oh, wow. um, and it just, mm -hmm. so that's why I take this personal, mm -hmm. that I have to figure out a way to change people's mindsets that, that we're, we're not going to retaliate over money or relationships or, or these things that are, that are non-tangible, mm -hmm. you know, turf that we don't, we'll never own. Right. I, I don't, I, I don't understand yeah. that. I'm trying to wrap my brain around that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get it, but I really don't get yeah, it. Yeah, um, I, I, I know. We're going to talk about different efforts and how you get yeah. to the youth. That's, that's really important. So, so let's go to the, the next thing in staffing your, um, the office, the required persons also include the violence interrupters. That's sort of one. What is a the, violence interrupter? The violence interrupter is a unique position because that person has to have an interesting background. They can't be, they have to be somebody that has a certain amount of street legitimacy mm -hmm. that can go into an at-risk neighborhood and, and connect to people on that level. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I can't say I'm squeaky clean, but I've been a police officer most of my career, and I don't see things through the lens of somebody that maybe grew up in a situation where things were incredibly hard and they had to steal or rob mm -hmm. to feed their families. I, I can't say I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be, I, I wouldn't be, I would be disingenuous if I went right. to try to portray that. Mm -hmm. So I need somebody that has that street credit, that mm -hmm. has been in that situation, that they can understand where these people are coming from, where that person is coming from that decides to do violence. Mm -hmm. And they can relate to them a lot better. On a different level. On a whole, a whole different, different level. Better Their level. lens is different. Their right. lens is clear. Mm -hmm. um, so I need those type of people that have, and that have connections in the neighborhood that can mm -hmm. identify who is really at risk, who's the one that's doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we work with that group and try to try to wrap around and connect them with opportunities to dissuade them from violence. One of the persons or the the employees that you're supposed to have, which I kind of skipped over here, are the analysts. And it says analysts who specialize in statistical data collection. What kind of data would you, would you, would the office be collecting? Well, when they wrote the legislation, they wrote it from the perspective that we were going to be using the National Network for Safe Communities engagement model, okay, which is, is a data-driven model. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's, and it's, it's got a track record. It's, pr it's a proven model that's been, that's been successful in several different jurisdictions. And mm -hmm. so that model consists of working with stakeholders, all the government agencies, law enforcement agencies. And once they use the data to it's data driven, meaning that they're going to collect data and mm -hmm. they, they collect the data actually from the, the local police jurisdiction. And that data identifies the, the people that are being involved in criminal activity the most. Because mm -hmm. what we've found out through the studies is that the majority of, of the crimes are being done by a small population. Right. It's the same, the same recidivist over and over again. And so with that data, we, we identify the people that are at most at risk and those that are most at risk for being retaliated upon mm -hmm. and try to contact them and get them to, to, to dissuade them from crime and, and, and violence. And that may mean things like simple as, as getting them to agree to a truce. You know, one, mm -hmm. one neighborhood is fighting another neighborhood and they realize that the violence is hurting their business, yeah. then maybe we need to figure out a different way. Mm -hmm. Even though their business may be illegal, mm -hmm. let's, let's work together. Your enemy is, 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 the, is the police and law enforcement mm -hmm. rather than each other. Mm -hmm. So we can figure out a way that you guys can't fight each other all the time because mm -hmm. you're losing your people. And then what happens? And, and Attorney General George, we're, we're such a small community that eventually the warring people, we wind up killing our own relatives, you know? Yeah, and so much. that that's where we really need to wake up and mm -hmm. stop this violence upon each other. So, so the violence interrupter goes in and, and tries to mitigate these things and navigate these, these waters of violence and come up with ideas and connect them with resources. That's awesome. And, and then the the data analyst also they keep that sort of data to be able to make those connections. Is that how they right? Do it? And and so right now we are using 
we are relying on the Virgin Islands Police Department's analysts mm -hmm. to give us those, to do that number crunching. Mm -hmm. Every every time there's a shooting, um, there there is supposed to be a shooting review. Mm -hmm. So our, the analysts kind of connect the dots. Did this shoot, was, was this shooting related to this past, the shooting from a couple months ago? Was, was it that retaliatory shooting? Mm -hmm. um, was this shooting just an anomaly? Was it just two people got into a fight? Was it a, a domestic violence issue? Right. So we try to eliminate the 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 information or try to isolate it so that we can show the connections also it's, it's a part of the mandate um, for the office of gun violence Pre prevention um, the the law talks about uh, formulating effective and innovative strategies designed to reduce and prevent gun vi gun violence and you pretty much talked about it and uh, answering the other questions, but right. how would you go about doing that just on a general basis? Well, a and the, the, the National Network for Safe Communities has the, has their model. Mm -hmm. And and um, most of the, 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 the pushback I get from folks is that we, we oftentimes have, oh, you're using this thing from the States, mm -hmm. it ain't gonna work here, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and my response to that is that, yeah, we're, we're using it as a model, not following it directly, because we have to translate it to our own culture, mm -hmm. our own island. Each St. Thomas stuff is different than St. Croix stuff. And so even within ourselves, we have a different way of how we want to do business. Mm -hmm. And so the model is just a structure. Um, and in addition to using their model, which is the engagement, data-driven engagement um, model, where we try to, you know, we, we have all the stakeholders, all the government agencies mm -hmm. are responsible for being a part of it. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're our, our, our workforce and or advisory council. And so it, it's incumbent upon us to come up with even on top of the national network model, come up with our own strategies of how we're going to enter into the neighborhoods. Like the, the police does things like the buyback, gun mm -hmm. buyback program. Mm -hmm. And we have um, one of, um, in, in St. Thomas, I mean, St. Croix, we have a, a young man that's doing, you know, Daddy's Day Out, where he invites all the fathers. Mm -hmm. And we have Miss Ayesha in, in St. Croix that does the, the victims, you know, walk. And there's mothers against, you know, violence. And right. so, you know, working with those organizations and, and trying to see what they're doing, we also want to come up with, with plans like that. And engagements for young people, engagements for um people that are in reentry programs that come out of prison, mm -hmm. you know, what do we have set up for them? We want to start to initiate programs for them to, to make them be successful. To keep them, keep, keep the recidivism rate. We put money in your right. hand, hopefully you won't put a gun in your hand. Okay, and that kind of goes to the, the, the next uh, mandate um, is initiatives for you to provide initiatives that provide recreational, vocational, and economic opportunities for young adults. There are, we, we, we're going to try to create some programs for young adults, and that means um, anti-violence programs, um, self-esteem programs, anti-bullying programs. Um, and you're saying economic opportunities, per, per, vocational. Personal so financial programs. A lot of our, it's funny, I, I, was, I, I was teaching a class today. I, I was teaching the police um, mm -hmm. instructor class, and one of the things that came out in conversation was that a lot of our young people don't get in high schools, they don't get training of how to handle your finances, how to do like life stuff, you know? So, you know, and a lot of times people don't, because they don't, they don't have those those opportunities that other mm -hmm. populations have. Absolutely. And so with that, I think, and, and, and being that training is my niche, I think, you know, I'm gonna push my staff to incorporate a lot of training, presentations, to have, you know, young people think about entrepreneurship, financial stability, financial counseling, mm -hmm. financial advising. The law requires the office also to, you know, recommend to the legislature um, different ways that we could strengthen our gun laws. Now, our gun laws are very, very strong. I mean, we've got some of the, one of the most stringent um, laws. In the and, country. And yet, in the country, exactly. Yeah. And yet... We're still facing this. Um, did you have any ideas so far? I know you just got in there, but any ideas on how it can be strengthened or if it needs to be strengthened or what the situation is? Guns are getting in the, in the territory two ways, on a boat or on an airplane. Mm -hmm. you know? And so they're either coming 
through the mail or on a boat or on a plane in somebody's bag. Mm -hmm. And and although we have a, a system in place to catch that and from the, those those guns, I, I, I think there's still some sneaking through the cracks. Right. And so, you know, we have to strengthen some of our processes rather than the laws. Now, mm -hmm. what we do have to do is keep up with technology. The laws have to change with technology. I mean, we're having now we're, we have to look at our tech, our laws that deal with ghost guns, um, people making 3D guns at home, mm -hmm. um, bringing parts through the mail um, or bump stocks, mm -hmm. things that that alter how a weapon works now are being sold. Mm -hmm. And so we have to now write legislation to say, if you're in possession of this device, we have to set up another law for that. Yeah, so, right, you know, as, as the technology grows, we need to figure out how we write our laws. And, and at the airport, I mean, there's a big sign saying you have 24 hours to report your weapon. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's tight enough. <laughs> you know, there, there, mm -hmm. there should be somebody there to, to, to take in that, to, to make that assessment. Okay, that's great. Now, t what have you been doing so far? Making sure that we secure, we've been doing some legal wranglings with our contract with the National Network for Safe Communities because they're going to be our, our mm -hmm. basically our advisors and um, consultants. So we've been dealing with the contract issue, um, been trying to create my office, build the office, open the office, mm -hmm. re recruiting staff, doing interviews with, with folks. And at the same time, going out into the community and, and doing safety presentations, anti-violence talks and teaching. And not just for law enforcement, but I, for any citizens, any, mm -hmm. any organizations, any government agency, private organizations, um, I teach um, active shooter response, I teach de-escalation, community service, conflict resolution. Then at the at the and even to the police academy, I, I teach them uh, customer service policing, procedural justice, um, de-escalation. You talk about workplace violence. Your workplace violence and prevention. That is yeah. prevention, rather. Yeah. Um, so, what kind of things? Um, that basically you talks about you? how you you get along with your coworkers and how you can de-escalate and 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 not get baited mm -hmm. into serious confrontations mm. with coworkers or customers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the customer service piece comes in because that, that talks about right. how to de-escalate a customer. You know, we have we have some people that are that are very, you know, they want what they want when they want it and if they don't get it, they react poorly. Mm -hmm. And so our 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 way to deal with that unruly customer, we have to kind of bring them down. So I teach that. I teach um um, how to just kind of calm things down and, and, and resolve the conflict. Okay, now I know that you indica indicated that you, you do active shooter training, and you're saying not only for law enforcement, but you also teach that kind of safety in those kinds of situations, even for, for civilians. Right. Um, what kind of tips can you give um, to just anyone, our citizens, our audience, yeah, usually, um, as far as protecting yourself in case there is a situation with an active shooter, which in fact we've had before. We've had a couple instances where there was a shooting on a beach and somewhere else. Right. What kind of safety tips can the, you give the general, right now? The general, the, 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 the general gist of active shooter training is the three things you have to do. You're either mm -hmm. you're going to run mm -hmm. or escape the situation, hide, mm -hmm. or if no other option exists, fight. Run, hide, and fight. When I do the training for companies and organizations, I, we, we, talk, we talk more in depth about those things. And, and when I talk about running and escaping, you're not just running haphazardly, but you're paying attention to where you're running. If the shooter is shooting you know, on the right side of me, I wanna run you know, to the left and I wanna get out of, out of harm's way. Or if, if I can't escape safely, then I'm gonna hide and I'm gonna lock down. I'm gonna make sure that the door is secure. I'm not gonna open it for anybody until the law enforcement comes and tells me that the coast is clear. Um, okay. And if I decide to fight, it has to be dynamic and I know I got the fight and I may be fighting to the death. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the, those are the main things of, of, of the active shooter processes. Mm -hmm. um, for personal protection though, I think, you know, we have a tendency as as humans to get ourselves into patterns of of of, of procedure mm -hmm. like you get up every morning 
you know, and you, you jump in your car and you drive to work and you probably drive the same streets the same way. Right. And when you go home, you do the same thing backwards. And so if somebody is paying attention to you, they know your system better than you. Um, and, and there's little simple things that we can do to, to make ourselves better. When you're walking to your car, you know, don't, don't unlock your car too soon because if it chirps and somebody's in the parking lot, lurking in the parking lot, as soon as you, you chirp it, they know where you're headed. They mm -hmm. know where you're going. Right. Um, yeah. You have to keep your head on a swivel or what I mean by that is you have to have situational awareness. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. You know, when I go to the ATM, when I, when I put my card in, while the machine is doing whatever it's doing, I'm looking around and seeing if a car pulls in behind me or if there's somebody on the other side of the building, you know, I'm, I'm walk, I'll look down and, and make sure. And then when money comes, grab my little money in my card and go mm -hmm. and don't stand around and wait. Um, right. You know, so things like that where we, and when, when you're at events, are you watching the crowd? Are you paying attention to the, to the energy of the crowd, which is a little more complicated, but I think we all know when, when things are starting to get bad and things aren't, you know, there's somebody getting, getting ready to fight. That's a good time to leave. My, par my, my parents always told me that when I, if I'm in a crowded area, crowded place, make sure to stand somewhere near an exit. So I, does, does that still follow yeah. through? Yeah, know Something where your exits like, are. I mean, no, th those are simple. Yeah. But so, we have to and we have to always know when it's time to go, it's time to go. Right. And don't. You know, it's like a, it's like a horror movies, you know, where the where the, you know, Jason is chasing them with the with the axe and the one person falls and the friend goes back to save them and then gets killed. Right. right. And you don't want to. I don't not, I'm not condoning leaving your friend, but you and your friend have to have a plan. Mm -hmm. And then when stuff's getting bad and we need to we need to break camp, mm -hmm. we are on our own mm -hmm. because Thank when you me. go back to save somebody or you unlock a door that you've secured, you put yourself at risk. Right. Those are good things to remember. Are you going to be uh, doing any more training? I mean, what to, to what extent is training, this type of training, um, a part of, of the future of, of well, the Office of Gun Violence um, Prevention? Since I've been talking to folks and being out there, I've been getting a lot of requests. Tell the audience I always want that some kind of a call to action, some way that they can know that they can become involved or at least get more information. So where or who would they contact if they want to either assist with the Office of Gun Violence Prevention or if they want to, to be able to benefit from some of the training? Here's I, I really want to get out to the public is that I am open for all ideas, all suggestions. Mm -hmm. I, I am not omnipotent. I, I, you know, I, I think I'm I think I'm pretty savvy. And I'm pretty smart. But I don't have all the answers. And I think some other people out there may have them. And so, look, feel free to call me and, and offer suggestions and, and, and tell me what you're doing and how you're doing it. And if my office can assist you and enhance what you're doing, then that's even better. 340-227-1049. That is the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank being you for having me. Being our guest on Justice me. Matters. This is very interesting, very enlightening as well. Well, thank great. You. It's great to be here. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Justice Matters.